Hello everyone and thanks for joining us again for the panel discussion in relation to our webinar on recovery colleges. I'm delighted to um, welcome Marianne Farkas, who is the chair of the International Network of Recovery Colleges um, at Boston University, and also Dory Hutchinson, who is the executive director of the Centre for Psych Psychiatric Rehabilitation and our director of services at the Recovery Education Centre at Boston University. I'm also delighted to welcome um, Graham Lucas, who is, um, has been a student of the Mind Recovery College and has been able to use the Mind Recovery College to improve his understanding of his own recovery and his ability to manage it. Um, I'm also pleased to welcome Professor Lisa Brophy. Lisa is a professor and discipline lead in social work and social policy at La Trobe University and has done a lot of research focusing on, um, uh, amongst other things, recovery from psychosocial disability and has also evaluated various recovery colleges and is also part of the International Network of Recovery Colleges. Uh, and finally, I'd like to welcome uh, Christy Bull. Christy is a recovery college facilitator and peer worker at MIND's um, group based recovery support program in Queensland, and she holds a Bachelor of Psychological Sciences. So, welcome again to our panel. Um, the first question today is for Graham, and we've heard in the webinar, Graham, how um, the recovery college really reframes the whole experience of. Um, getting a mental health service into a, more of an education type of paradigm. Can you tell us um, what that meant to you in learning about your, your recovery? Thanks, Nicola. Nicola, it was a really important opportunity for me to learn more around my mental illnesses. So this was information I, I gathered on top of what would have been the customary medical model of going to my psychiatrist, um, going to my psychologist, um, and also going to other support individuals. As far as the, the recovery college is concerned, I learned so much by being in the company of um, consumers and carers. And I do want to emphasize the importance of carers for me to get learnings around that that I can include in my own individual circumstances with my family. So the, the setting for the recovery college is completely distinct from what goes on within the medical model. So as I said, having the opportunity to be in the company of um, consumers of uh, mental health services meant so much for me because up until that point, I pretty much thought I was the only one that was experiencing these range of mental illnesses that I did have. So to be in their company, to hear about their experiences, to hear about the things that they um, have in their own personal lifestyles was very significant to me. The other point I want to include is the role of the facilitators within the recovery college. I was very fortunate um, uh, to have two facilitators that were just so genuine in terms of their connection with all of the students. They were particularly patient in trying to guide people to feel comfortable within the group. So I'll always be in debt to the Recovery College for the facilitators that I was able to access. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Dory and Marion, we've heard a lot about how the recovery colleges and the idea of being a student in your own recovery is um, very powerful. But can the recovery college actually be a stepping stone to other educational and employment opportunities? And how might you facilitate that? Dory, I'll let you answer that first. I might have a few words at the end. 
Okay, great. It's that's a, an excellent question. Um, I think that we've learned over these years that the recovery college that we've been running, our recovery center, is definitely a place where people develop readiness to go to work and to go back to school. Um, part of it is the structure of having to come, uh, show up, uh, take classes, take notes. Um, the content of the classes are related to, many of them are related to different phases of choosing, getting, and keeping work. So the content is really relevant. Um, we also provide in our recovery education center vocational peer support. So people who are looking to go back to work are, as, as Graham was saying, are, are sitting together and talking and sharing strategies and supporting one another. And then I think what we've learned over time too is that in terms of the experience of being in an educational environment that it has very strong cognitive remediation effects and that people who haven't, who've been in psychiatric institutions or been taking a lot of uh, medications, they've been out of work, they've been out of school, um, they haven't had the opportunity or, or even felt ready to start reading again and following instructions and you know, being able to um, do those sorts of cognitive tasks. And they find that um, the practice of being in the Recovery Education Center helps them prepare, prepare for their next step, whether that be going back to school or going to work. Yeah, I think the only thing I'd add to that just very quickly, and it might be self-evident that one of the strengths of the recovery education, recovery college, we use those terms somewhat interchangeably, um, is the voluntary nature of the program. People mm -hmm. come there because they want to come, they want to apply. So I always get a little nervous when people talk about one program being a jump off point or a, a step along the way to another point, because I would imagine that some people would perhaps go to work and simultaneously participate in a recovery college, or they might go to an educational program like ours is on the grounds of Boston University. Maybe they take a class or something at Boston University while they're in the recovery college. So I would want to make sure that people understood that it isn't a preparatory program and you must go to that and then you'd sequence it with the next thing. Sometimes it's simultaneous, sometimes it's first and then you come back. Yeah, <clears throat> excellent point, Marianne, because that's exactly what happens. You no, know, different people do different things. Thank you. Um, Lisa, the next question is for you. So you've done quite a lot of research uh, looking at the evidence uh, to support recovery colleges. What have you learned? Well, I think um, it was terrific to hear Marianne already um, summarise some of the research in her presentation. And, uh, and I think, you know, I just want to reiterate some of the things that Marianne spoke about, that there have been some really good attempts to um, evaluate recovery colleges in all parts of the world. So there's been lots of evaluation in the United Kingdom and certainly at the moment there's some, some really major efforts to evaluate recovery colleges in the UK. A big project called Recollect that um, I'm an international advisor for is you know, really trying to get a strong sense of of recovery colleges, what they're doing, how and how they work, you know. So we talk about fidelity. So what are the kinds of things that you need to, the elements that you need to have in a recovery college that actually um, foster ensuring that they have the kinds of outcomes we're hoping to achieve. But what are those outcomes? And it's really interesting that the one thing that I would really start with, and um, I did a, a, I've led an evaluation of the recovery college, the pilot that was held in um, in Canberra in the ACT. A wonderful service. And what we entitled our, our report was an oasis of hope, inclusion and connection. It was that sense of people coming to a place that was so innovative and so different to anything that they'd experienced before um, and really was getting them on a journey that they hadn't been almost invited to be on for a long time in their lives. And it was really wonderful. And so I don't think we can discount just how 
satisfied people are with recovery colleges. If you know, we sometimes you know don't think of satisfaction that much, you know, because we don't think it indicates very much. But I think satisfaction is actually really important, and people really love recovery colleges. They have high levels of satisfaction. People feel really safe there. Um, and this idea of a step, stepping stone, and I think Marianne has made a really, really important comment about the idea that we're not in some, you know, neoliberal kind of situation where saying, right, you've got to go to the recovery college and then you've got to demonstrate this and demonstrate this and off you go. A recovery college has a purpose of enabling people to feel connected. Um, but I think, I think that metaphor of the stepping stone is actually a really valuable one. And it keeps coming up in the research that I've done and in the research that I look at. So this sort of idea of a stepping stone that enables people to start thinking about um, other opportunity, taking up other opportunities for work or education, um, or even just you know, flourishing more in the community through being perhaps a volunteer or more confident about other roles that they have. So I think they're important, but. Uh, I'm going on a bit, bit, but the other thing I wanted to say is that it's not only the students who benefit from the college, um, but often the other people who are benefiting are, are the educators who, who um, participate in the college and also other staff, you know, other mental health service staff who come to the college to do things, whether they come as a, as a student themselves or whether they come as an educator, they also start um, gaining benefits as well. And some of those benefits they take back to the agencies that it come from. So you see this kind of potential for culture change. So, you know, there are just a few things really that I see in evaluation of recovery colleges that I think I've wanted to highlight. Thanks so much, Lisa, that's great. And you've set up um, the next question beautifully, which is for Christy. Um, so Christy, tell us about being a facilitator at Minds Recovery College and, you know, how is it different and, and what have you learned from the experience? Yeah, sure. Um, look, as as humans, we're we're naturally curious. We like to have reasons and explanations as to you know why things are happening. And and mental health um, or mental ill health is is no no exception to that. So, um, you know, in my experience as a facilitator, we create a safe place for people to explore reasons as to you know how we might feel or um, how other people may feel from our actions or our feelings as well and it it kind of just gives um, people like these these light bulb moments and um, it's quite incredible when you you witness one of those light bulb moments because you know from that moment on um, that person's going to think in, in a little bit of a different way moving forward and it just brings back, brings so much self-awareness, um, which is a super important component of recovery. And uh, like Lisa said, us as facilitators get just as much out of it. Um, we meet with so many different people from so many different walks of life. And the amount of strategies that I've gained over the last two years, just given to me from other people, it's not even, you know, the, the content that we're learning about. And, you know, and it gives them a sense of purpose as well. And, and know that they can use some of maybe negative experiences for good to share with other people. And, and, um, yeah, we've got we've got a, a participant at the moment that actually takes some of the stuff home to his family and um, is teaching teenage daughters to have you know things around self confidence and and stuff like that. So the, to know that the education just doesn't stop here, it actually trickles on to other people's um, important people in their life. Uh, yeah, it's re really great that it's. Um, able to be done in a setting that's so accepting and it's done on a level of mutuality and um, our recovery college is, is purely um, led by peer practitioners and the participants that are attending the college as well. So yeah, it's super important. <laughs> Thank you so much. So the next question really is um, around how you deliver the recovery college and of course we've all been living through the COVID-19 pandemic which has seen us all um, working from home um, and it and you know delivering things through telehealth 
Um, a really important component of the recovery college is obviously building that sense of community, which you tend to do much more in, in person. Um, how much can you adapt the learning modules to online delivery and how would you go about um, creating that sense of community in, in that environment? And I'd put it to Dory and Marion first and then maybe if Christy, um, Lisa and Graham wanted to add to that, that would be great. Go ahead, Dory. I'll follow up with what the network tells me. Uh, so we we had about five days to make that transition from in all in person and to your point, Lisa, a beloved community where people came and felt welcomed and safe and coffee and music and all of that. And um, we pivoted to online. And I think we were very concerned that folks wouldn't be able to do it and wouldn't want to do it. But then as the pandemic stretched out over so many months and we really had two people pretty much working almost full time and uh, we getting computers to people because not everyone had access um, to an online learning opportunity. They didn't have computers or internet and we were able to make arrangements for that but it took us about two and a half months. Um, and since once that happened, we were then having staff who were coaching people who are having a hard time signing on to Zoom um, and using passwords and feeling very frustrated by all of that. But I would say now um, we, we successfully pivoted. And what we found is that we had really high attendance because people were lonely. You know, they were living by themselves in apartments and um, we were doing our, we changed our courses are usually an hour and a half long and we went to 45 minutes to an hour instead because people were getting Zoom fatigue. But a lot of people who were unable to come in for multiple classes now could take those multiple classes in their home. Um, and the, uh, the instructors did a great job. We had some training around how to do breakout rooms to make for more intimate conversations. And we had instructors who learned how to you know, do their music and their art. Um, and we did cooking classes where, you know, so we kind of learned together, but we were able to do it and people really liked it. Now, when we're coming back to in-person, there, there are still a number of people who feel very afraid to come back. So we've gone half and half um, and they like the online. It makes them feel safer. Um, and they feel like, you know, they, our facilitators are very good at engaging every single person on the screen. So people feel heard and seen. Yeah, so just following up on that, Dory, um, we had a conversation and uh, so the network that I chair has 44 countries involved and you know some of them are active and some of them lurk <clears throat> but when we were talking about online learning and, and pivoting to online everyone pretty much had the same experience that you're describing Dory that people were afraid at the beginning and I don't just mean the students I mean the facilitators the students the whole everybody everybody started out being afraid anyway because it was COVID then when you add to it all of the technology um, so in Israel where they're very technologically oriented they did a lot on cell phones because some people didn't have access ready access to computers and they learned how to redesign the shapes of things that they were showing so that it would fit well on a mobile screen and tablets and some people got foundation funding to give buy tablets for students which helped um and um there was a, a recovery college group in vancouver that are just starting out and they listened to all of this and one person said, well, it seems like the only thing you can't do online is give each other a hug. And that engender a whole other conversation, but um, it was sort of community building without hugs. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> what did you do? Well, you couldn't do those in real life anyway. So. <laughs> That's right. You could do a, a elbow bump at least, but... Um, Lisa, but people you... learn to shift what they mean by community from, mm. you know, having to be a presence to being, as Dory said, you know, really being able to listen and interact with each other mm. as strongly as they ever did. Mm. 
Lisa, did you have anything to yeah, add? Well, well, the evaluation that we did of the ACT Recovery College pilot, we did the whole thing while, you know, all on Zoom. Um, we never went there. It was such so sad. But but in a way, we really felt connected to people. We were able to, you know, do our interviews and focus groups and meet with our um, co-design group and all, all through Zoom. But one of the things that I, I think we've learned, and I think Dorian and Marianne are saying this as well, is that some people actually do feel very safe in the online environment. They like being in their own homes. They don't have to travel. Um, there are lots of of impediments maybe for some people that are actually removed in the online environment. And we've learned a lot about that. But then there's, for some people, there's no substitute for face-to-face -face either. So it's it's really been an, a really interesting learning experience, but I'm just so impressed by what I've learned about recovery colleges and their ability to pivot to this, you know, this word pivot, but, you know, to pivot to these online environments. And then, and then I think, it would be wonderful to investigate how well recovery colleges did in actually enabling people during that time to then learn the skills that they needed to learn in the recovery college that then they could transfer to a whole lot of other aspects of their lives because who else was going to teach people how to use zoom and how to make the best use of their smartphone and all those things and people had the recovery college to do that for them and I'm sure that there were so many people who were so grateful for that and you know as we were all struggling through and learning how to do it and when people are quite marginalized and and disempowered you know that was always the worry I think during the COVID-19 the, the height of the restrictions and recovery colleges were probably doing a wonderful service to so many people at that time. Fabulous um Graham do you have any reflections on, I mean, you, you, I don't think, had to learn in the virtual environment, but, you know, from your experience as a student of the Recovery College, would it have worked the same way? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. What I can recall is that when I first commenced with the Recovery College, for me to actually get from home to the college was developing my day-to-day -day skills again. And that was really important because that led to me being able to have the confidence to go and do grocery shopping or go and into the city by myself. So that was that was a good avenue to get that confidence back again. I acknowledge that for some people, sure, they do feel safe in the Zoom setting. For me, uh, I would have missed out on having that face-to-face -face with other um, peers in the college and to be able to develop a conversation with them outside of that mind session. So, yeah, and that, that was not just with consumers, that was also with carers. So uh, I don't know exactly the extent of the opportunity within the Zoom session. I understand the reason for it, but I think we need to be aware that those other opportunities would not necessarily be available to consumers and carers. Fantastic. Christy, did you have any reflections on the virtual versus real life options? Yeah, so um, we actually found out, um, so I'm actually in Queensland in Australia um, and I think our longest lockdown was like six weeks and we've only had one. So we were quite fortunate, um, but we actually found out we couldn't do face-to-face -face in the middle of a group session. Um, and you could just see the, the panic go over the, the participants and students' face and be like, ah, oh, so what are we going to do? <laughs> um, so I actually was the only peer worker at the time with the capability of working from home. Um, so I single-handedly started doing up documents with all the um, courseware and, um, you know, writing bits of my own lived experience in there as well to kind of feel like we were connecting on that level. And um, a lot of our people didn't have um, access to internet or, or computers. So we were actually mailing out stuff for them and then just catching up with them on the phone. Um, or, you know, if their outreach worker or case manager or whatever wanted to call in and, you know, ask questions about the material, then that's how we sort of stayed connected. Um, I, I totally agree with Graham. The face-to-face -face element is 
um, it's a different level of connection. Uh, I think there is definitely a space for the online component and we still use that today for people who um, are finding it a bit challenging to be in a group or um, it's a good way to maybe ease them into coming into the college. Um, so we still have that option there. We just use it in a gentle way to introduce face to face or if they just had one course that they really wanted to do, you know, we would engage them in that way and um, if that worked for them. So it's a good thing about the recovery colleges is, um, you know, our setting is very, very adaptable and flexible and any way to get that education out there um, will we'll kind of adapt to. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so much, Christy. And thank you so much to the rest of um, the panel for joining us today. So obviously, um, you know, a really key feature of these recovery colleges is moving recovery into an education, educational paradigm. And it moves people who are experiencing the challenges of mental ill health from being a passive recipient to having much more of an understanding of and control and all autonomy over their own recovery um, and the lived experience components and the community building components are so important I think in, in building agency and hope um, and we've heard from Lisa that the evidence is emerging but it's really positive and there are so many ways that we can think about um, how the recovery college can be adapted for different groups uh, and different recovery goals and different forums and different ways of delivery. Uh, so here in Victoria, we, we were delighted to see that um, the recovery colleges have received attention in our Victorian Royal Commission recommendations. Uh, and we're keen to work with anyone who's um, watching the webinar or the panel session uh, to work in partnership around implementation. Uh, and in a moment, we'll put up a, um, a slide uh, for a contact for further information, but right now I'd just like to thank the participants um, very much for participating today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thanks.